Hello everybody and welcome to the second video in our Halloween week series. Today's case is not your typical spooky case, but I chose this case specifically because I truly believe that the messages that we can learn from this case are so, so very important to discuss. But before we get into today's case, I wanted to go ahead and take a minute to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that allows you to shop from over 600 different brands. They let you choose a new authentic designer fragrance every single month for only $15. I really love Scentbird because they allow you to test all of the top perfumes and colognes for a fraction of the price of what it costs to actually buy the bottle. I am so picky with my scents and I'm someone who likes to have a different perfume depending on the event, so a different one for work or for going out or for going on a date. Also, I don't know if anyone else is like this, maybe I'm just a little bit awkward, um, but I'm always a little bit self-conscious wondering if I smell okay to others because if you wear the same scent every single day, your nose starts to get used to that scent, so you never know if the scent were off or I can never remember if I put on a scent in the first place if I don't smell it. So having a new scent every single month is really nice because then I get a little whiff of that scent throughout the day and I know that I am always smelling nice. And if you have a really nice perfume on, it's always nice to smell it once in a while. You can discover new scents by taking a quiz on Scentbird and then based on your preferences, your previous purchases, and your quiz answers, they will help you find the perfect fragrance for you. Every month, you get to pick exactly what you want to try, so there's no surprises, so you know that you'll always love the scents that you get, and that goes for both men and women. I think it's really nice because even if there's a scent that I really love and I don't want to try one the next month, sometimes I will pick one out for my boyfriend on a scent that he likes as a little gift, or if you want to skip the month altogether, that's fine too because they are super flexible and don't charge any penalties for skipping. With each fragrance, you get a 30-day supply so you can try it out for an entire month before committing to a full bottle. And if you want to, you can even upgrade it to getting it two to three cents per month. Scentbird works directly with top designer brands like Prada Gucci and Versace, as well as indie labels like Vince Kamadu, Rag and & Bone, and Confessions of a Rebel. They come in these cute little roll-up cases and they actually give you a pretty nice amount of fragrance. It's actually really cool because the website will tell you exactly what's in the fragrance so you know exactly what to expect and then you receive these little pamphlets as well that also describe the scent, give you the ingredients, and then kind of show you the actual picture of what the bottle really looks like. This one is from Scents of Wood in Sandalwood Oak and for this one the scents are sandalwood, burnt sugar, smoked sage, guayac wood, and vanilla. I really like this one because I can really smell the vanilla and it kind of just has like a little bit of a foresty scent. I feel like this one is good for men or women, honestly. It's good for both. The next one is from Gucci. It's called Gossi di Fiori and I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that one, um, but I love this one because I am absolutely obsessed with floral scents. This one is Ragoon Creeper, Tuber Rose, I'm so sorry if I'm saying also that wrong, um, and then Jasmine Bud. And then the last one I have is Christian Serrano Intimate Silhouette. Um, this one is Jasmine Petals, Black Sesame Seed, Amberwood, Madagascar, Vanilla Absolute, and Cashmere Musks. I really like this one for a date. If you just want to smell like feminine and soft. Now, the thing I like about this is that you get a free refillable case with your first order. But on top of that, which I am so excited about, is that if you use my link down below in the description box and use code RS30, you can get 30% off of your first month, which is only $10 to start. You can go ahead and download their app and it works for Android or iOS and it's really easy to use. Just go ahead and click the link. So again, make sure to go ahead and click the link down in the description box and use code RS30 to start your first month for only $10. Thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. Now, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. This case involves a young woman whose relationship seemed to be absolutely perfect, but behind closed doors, it was nothing like it seemed. 
it seemed like so many misconceptions believed by young people allowed for so many horrible things to happen despite her mother's best efforts to protect her and keep her safe. So I really hope you guys stick around till the end because I will be discussing some very, very important messages that I am so, so passionate about. Today, we are going to be discussing the solved murder of Jenny Crompton. Jenny Crompton was only 15 years old when her life was ripped away from her on September 26, 1986. Jenny lived with her family in the rural town of Bettendorf in Iowa. Jenny was the oldest of two siblings, her 10-year-old younger sister, Katie, who shared the same father as her from her mother, Vicky's first marriage, and a younger one-year-old baby brother, Stephen, who was the son of Jenny's stepfather, Greg, who was Vicky's second husband. In middle school, Jenny had a hard time fitting in, and much like other kids her age, she had a bit of an awkward stage at this time. She needed glasses starting when she was 10, she had braces, and she didn't really know how to fit in or to really make any friends. However, as she grew older into her teens, she grew into this beautiful, confident, intelligent, and outgoing young woman. By 1985, Jenny was a freshman at the Pleasant Valley High School in Riverdale, Iowa. She was basically everything you could ask for in your daughter at her age. She was on the honor roll. She was involved in numerous clubs. She was on the dance team and had tons of friends. She had always been an avid reader and cared a lot about her academics and that carried throughout her short life. She learned very easily so by the time she was a sophomore in high school, she was actually taking both French and Spanish classes at the same time. She had dreams of using her language skills to find her a career that could take her to Europe so she could get out and explore the world. During her freshman year, Jenny began dating a boy from her high school named Mark Smith. Mark Smith was a tall, blonde, good-looking, and charming young man. Of course, Jenny's mother, Vicky, didn't really know what to think of him at first because suddenly her daughter is this beautiful, popular young woman who already has a boyfriend. However, Vicky soon found out that Mark is actually four years older than Jenny, and she was absolutely furious. She initially told Jenny that she was not allowed to date Mark, but she eventually softened up to the idea because he just seemed like such a nice kid. He was polite, and he didn't act too mature in a way that made Vicky uncomfortable, and he followed the strict rules that Vicky had set in place to keep an eye on their relationship. And their relationship seemed to flourish, so she just wanted her daughter to be happy. The two shared a locker at school. They ate lunch together. They would talk on the phone every single day and sometimes even several times per day. Mark would come over to Jenny's house three or four times a week. Like I said, Jenny had some strict rules, but the two didn't seem very bothered by them. For example, the two would often go to the movies together and go to different school functions together, but Vicky would not allow Jenny in Mark's car, so she drove them everywhere. According to those around them at school, Jenny and Mark were the perfect couple and they were totally in love. However, despite Vicky feeling that she had a pretty good handle on the relationship and saw that Jenny was very clearly happy with Mark, she wasn't quite sure exactly what it was that drew her to him. The two didn't really have anything in common and didn't really share any similar interests. He was pretty much just into cars and riding around his motorcycle around the town with his friends, while she loved reading and dance and art. He also seemed like he wasn't the best student in school and wasn't really interested in building a career for himself. Vicky knew that Jenny had big dreams for herself and wanted a career and wanted to go out and see the world. So when Vicky asked Mark what his plans were after high school and he told her that he didn't really have any, Vicky was very disappointed and knew that him and Jenny were not going to last very long. This is when the time came that Jenny and her mother had the dreaded conversation about sex. Vicky knew that Jenny was thinking about becoming a lot more intimate with Mark, so one night she went to Jenny and said that if she ever had thoughts about doing so with Mark, that she hopes that Jenny would come to her first. Vicky tried her best to build that trust between herself and her daughter and and wanted to let her know that she could talk to her about anything without fear of getting in trouble or getting judged. So the very next day, Jenny did just that. 
she confided in her mother that she was actually thinking about sleeping with Mark. Of course, Vicky did not want her to, especially with someone who was so wrong for Jenny. So Vicky went and found another trusted teenager through her work and got her to talk to Jenny about her own experiences with having this type of relationship too early. And after speaking to this other girl, Jenny did decide that she was not actually ready to become intimate with Mark. And not only this, but she decided that she no longer wanted to be in a relationship with him at all. She told her mom, I just want to be free. I envy my friends who don't have boyfriends. So at this point, Jenny tried to break it off with Mark. She tried to just phase him out and let him go easily, but he would not let that happen. He still shared her locker with her and he would not leave. He would wait for her after classes so that he could walk with her. He started calling the house more and more frequently and would frequently drop by the house unannounced. She tried to do whatever she could to get him to stop and told him that she wanted to break up with him. However, the more she tried to pull away, the more persistent Mark became. His random calls and visits increased even more and he would never let her be alone at school whatsoever. So at this point, 15 year old Jenny didn't know what to do. She tried asking her friends for advice, but of course, they weren't really able to help her either. Eventually, this was just too much for her, so she just gave up and agreed to get back together with him. She assured her mother that this was what she wanted and she had never even been sure in the first place if she even wanted to break up with Mark. So for the following few months, they continued dating, but this time it was a lot more of an on again, off again type of relationship. She tried to pull away, but as she did so, his actions just became more and more intense. She would try to hide her plans from Mark, but he always found a way to manipulate her friends into telling him exactly what she was doing. He would show up at Jenny's dance practices to pick her up just a few minutes before her mother would get there. She would go to the mall with her friends only to find that Mark was there waiting for her. Anytime a guy tried to talk to Jenny, he would immediately let them know that she belonged to him. There was even this one time where Jenny had this family reunion on her dad's side of the family and Mark somehow struck up a friendship with one of her cousins and the cousins invited him to the family reunion. He did all of that just to go to the family reunion and watch her and see what she was doing. Another night, the family decided to go on a spur of the moment trip to the ice cream store which was only about a block's walk away. As they were walking, they noticed something moving behind the cars parked across the street from their house. When Greg went to go check and see what it was, lo and behold, it was Mark and another friend crouching behind the cars and watching their house. By August of 1986, Jenny had had enough with him and she told her mother that she had officially broke it off with Mark and she was not going to be getting back together with him this time and she was completely Done. By that September, Jenny had started back up at school for her sophomore year. She was so happy and excited to start this new year of school to be completely free of Mark since he had graduated just a few months prior. At this point, the calls stopped. He stopped showing up at the house and Vicky was comfortable knowing that Mark was no longer bothering her daughter. Now, September 26th, 1986 started as a very normal day for the family. Vicky woke up Jenny for school and the two talked for a bit about the homecoming game that was set for that evening. Jenny had asked if she could ride to the homecoming dance with her friends instead of having Vicky drive her and Vicky agreed. After this, Vicky kissed Jenny goodbye and went to work. Vicky worked a normal day and then left work at her normal time. She started her drive home, but little did she know that by the time she arrived home, her life would change in the most tragic way possible. When Vicky arrived home from work, she was met with groups of neighbors who were all standing in their yards, all looking at her house. She then saw ambulances and police cars and a fire truck. She saw police officers running back and forth in and out of her house. So she parked her car and ran out as fast as she could to ask police what was happening, but of course, they did not allow her to enter the house. This is when police told Vicky that Jenny had been stabbed multiple times and that paramedics were doing whatever they could to try and save her. She ran over to Greg, who was very visibly shaken and upset 
and Greg told her that he had walked in the house only to find that Jenny was lying there in a pool of blood. Ambulances took her to the hospital, but there was nothing that they could do to save her. 15-year-old Jenny Crompton had been murdered. Immediately, police started their investigation. They started to interview all of Jenny's friends, and right away, they saw this picture of the reality of Jenny and Mark's relationship. For the entirety of their relationship, especially the last few months, Mark had verbally and physically abused Jenny. All of Jenny's friends knew that the abuse was happening, and they tried to handle it themselves. They would see Mark shoving and pushing Jenny around, but according to the other teens at the school, this was something that they saw a lot of boyfriends doing to their girlfriends, so they thought that this was normal. Mark had made written threats towards Jenny, but again, the friends thought that they could handle it themselves. They didn't realize how serious the abuse was, especially behind closed doors. Vicky had absolutely no idea that this was happening, and in fact, no adults in Jenny's or her friends' lives knew that this was happening either. Mark hid the side of himself from adults very, very well, making everyone around him believe that he was a really nice guy. So it didn't take long before 19-year-old Mark Smith was arrested for the murder of 15-year-old Jenny Crompton. He went to trial, and this is when the details about Jenny's murder came out. On the afternoon of Friday, September 26, 1986, Jenny got off the school bus to arrive home from school. The house was empty because her parents were still at work, and I imagine her siblings were still at school. She had plans to meet up with her friends that evening for the homecoming game. However, Mark had actually broken into the house that day and was waiting in the bathroom for Jenny to get home. And turns out this was not the first time that he had broken into the family home. Turns out he had been doing this for months before, but no one knew about it. So Mark said that on this particular day, he knew that Jenny was cheating on him, so he confronted her about it. And it was at this point that Jenny and him had gotten into a very bad argument, and then he grabbed the butcher knife and stabbed Jenny. However, what is believed to have actually happened is that Jenny had been looking at some mail as she was walking in, so she wasn't paying attention, while Mark was standing there waiting for her, already holding the butcher knife. He then took her by surprise and stabbed Jenny a total of 66 times all over her back and her chest. She was also covered in defensive wounds, so it was very clear that Jenny fought for her life with everything she had. So at this point, after doing this, it's believed that Mark had seen that Greg was coming home, so that scared Mark off and he fled, leaving Jenny behind to just lay there in her blood and being found shortly after. After stabbing Jenny 66 times, Mark went to the homecoming football game with a date and was seen laughing with friends, and he ate at the concession stands, and he was just having an overall jolly good time, acting completely happy and normal. Also, at the trial, many of Jenny's friends and classmates testified about how controlling and abusive Mark was. One after another, so many young teens said that they knew what was going on, but they thought it was normal. They thought that it happened in every relationship and that it was no big deal. No one told an adult and somehow none of the adults at her school had noticed. Somehow, all of this abuse was happening and it was just allowed to keep escalating until he violently ripped away Jenny's life from her. At the end of the trial on January 23rd, 1987, Mark Smith was convicted of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. He is still currently serving his life sentence at the Iowa State Penitentiary. Now, after serving 31 years in prison, 49-year-old Mark Smith actually appealed his life sentence. Now, it has been ruled that lengthy mandatory minimum sentences without parole is unconstitutional for juveniles convicted of crimes. So, when appealing, Mark said that he was facing cruel and unusual punishment and should be considered for release since he was only 19 years old at the time of the crime and that young adults and juveniles should be treated the same because their mental and emotional development is very similar. However, the Iowa Court of Appeals denied this request and stated that he was properly sentenced because young adults and juveniles are not in the same classes and should be handled differently, which I agree with. 
there is a significant difference between a 13 year old child and a 19 year old adult. He is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong and in my opinion, he should not have been treated like a child whatsoever. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he was taking someone's life. He violently stabbed her and didn't have any remorse after laughing and acting normal with his friends. There's absolutely no way that he should ever be released or treated as anything other than an adult. Now, the reason that I wanted to cover this case today, it's not necessarily a Halloween case. It doesn't really relate to the whole spooky Halloween theme, but I think that this case is so very important to share with my audience. The demographics of people who watch this channel are mainly women between the ages of 18 and 30 years old, so I feel that sharing this story is so, so important to hear. After Jenny's murder, of course, Vicky was absolutely destroyed. She had no idea how she was going to go on to raise her 10-year-old daughter and her one-year-old son. She didn't know how she was just going to go into work every day for the rest of her life, knowing the horrific things that her daughter went through. However, Vicky eventually picked herself back up and used this pain to speak out against the very type of abuse that her daughter faced for so many months in her short life. Vicky travels across the country to different schools, churches, and youth groups to tell Jenny's story. She wants young girls to know that this type of behavior in a relationship is not normal. She talks about how there are huge differences to be aware of between abuse in teen relationships versus adult relationships. The difference for teens is that they face a societal pressure every day to be in a relationship and have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Not only that, but they are very young and inexperienced and don't always know how they should be treated in relationships. So many of Jenny's peers thought that this behavior was normal. They had no idea that this was not how a boy should treat a girl. And to this day, of course, so many of Jenny's friends feel immense guilt for not speaking up, but how are they supposed to speak up when they simply didn't know any better? Vicky makes sure not to sugarcoat her daughter's death. She wants young people to know their worth, what signs to look out for, and how to get out of relationships like this. But at the same time, she provides an open ear for every single young person that she speaks in front of, male or female. She wants her audience to know that girls are not the only ones who are abused and that men facing abuse shouldn't be afraid to come forward because they don't deserve that either. And just because they're a guy, doesn't mean that their feelings are not valid. Vicky has said that as she's giving these speeches, she can look into the crowd and just know by their faces who may be experiencing the same type of abuse. And that is just giving me chills even just saying that. She also wants to talk to parents and spread awareness so that they can be on the lookout for these different warning signs. She has spoken about different questions that parents can ask themselves if their daughter is in a relationship. First, is the boyfriend possessive or does he try to isolate the girl? Vicky explained that Mark did not want Jenny to have any friends. She said that a lot of young girls and even older women will sort of slip into this and give in and end up being totally isolated, even if they don't even realize it, without having anybody to turn to. In that case, after the girl loses all of her friends, the guy will just be in almost total control over her and be able to manipulate her in any way that he wants. In Jenny's case, she was very strong-willed and would absolutely not allow herself to be separated from her friends. So Mark just went ahead and made friends with her friends and tried to manipulate them. Mark, similarly to a lot of controlling partners, just could not understand why Jenny had friends and why she wanted to spend time with her family. The next question is, is especially if they're in a very young relationship, does he speak a lot about their future? Vicky explained that Jenny was a very career-oriented young woman with big dreams of traveling across the country and having a career and just doing things for herself. However, after dating Mark, she would come home and all she ever wanted to talk about was getting married to Mark and how she was so excited for their wedding and all she wanted in her life now was just to be married to Mark. So of course, he kind of manipulates her into a way of just being like, I'm the only goal in your life. 
I'm the only thing that matters. Your job doesn't matter. Your education doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is us. And that is a very toxic mindset to be in when you are so young, but even in general, young girls should not just be focused on who they're dating in high school. And even if they're not in an abusive relationship, that can still be very isolating and let them lose track of their goals in life. Next, Vicky advises parents to not only get to know the boyfriend, but the boyfriend's family. Mark was someone who did not speak about his parents and he didn't even mention them to Vicky and she knew nothing about them. In fact, her first time ever meeting Mark's parents was in court. She learned that Mark had emotional problems since the age of four. When he was 16, his own mother moved out of their house because Mark was so violent. The whole family was abusive towards one another and Vicky had no idea that this was the type of environment that Mark was growing up in and that this is all he knew. She didn't know that Mark was raised to be abusive and be controlling of another person and that's how you deal with problems is to control them and to abuse them. She advises that if you suspect your daughter is in an abusive relationship to talk to his parents and to figure out exactly what's going on. Next, you want to help your daughter realize that she can be in danger. She says, the best way to do this is to just listen to Jenny's story. Make them aware of how they should be treated and what can happen if they stay. Obviously, this shouldn't be done as a scare tactic or a threat or anything like that, but making them aware. A lot of girls in high school and a lot of young teenage girls in general think that their relationship is their whole life and that if they break up with their boyfriend that they're never going to have anyone again, which obviously most of us grow out of that and know that that's not true. But a lot of people and even young adults or adults who have been in abusive relationships, they are made to believe that they will never find anyone again, that no one will treat them as well as you know this abusive partner is. They are made to believe that they can never be loved and that if they leave this other person that there's nothing else out there for them. So as a parent, you need to tell your child that that's not true. You need to let them know that they are loved and that again, they should not be treated like this. Lastly, she wants to teach your daughters how to break up with him strongly and firmly. So many young people or people of any age, I've done this, say things like, we can still be friends. And Vicky says that Jenny said this to Mark on her advice, but she now realizes that you have to be firm and say, don't ever call me again. Don't ever contact me again. And things like that. Make it very, very clear that you do not want them in your life. This can be incredibly difficult because again, a young girl may not want to cut him off completely. She may want to have just, you know, a small grasp on him just to, you know, keep him at arm's length and to let him, you know, maybe Maybe she wants to try and be friends with him. So parents need to do their best to help their child with this and again explain why this is so important and why you need to just cut them off. This is not easy for anyone, let alone a young girl who thinks that her whole life will be over if she breaks up with this boy who she really cares about. And I also wanna say that even if you're not a parent, you yourself can use these tips to protect yourself in relationships. I'm 23 years old and my parents aren't telling me who I should be dating and who I shouldn't be dating. And that's the case for probably most of you. Most of you are probably at the age where you are choosing who you date and you are choosing how to go about your relationships. Any of these tips can be used for anyone in their own life or their friend's life or their children's life. And it's definitely something that I plan on carrying with me for the rest of my life as something to keep an eye out for when I do eventually have children. Those are a lot of the main points that Vicky mentions about what to look out for in terms of abusive relationships. But I also want to mention that it is so, so very important to be the type of parent that your kid can talk to. I know that a lot of parents just jump straight to grounding or yelling or punishing when their kid brings up sex or relationships or anything like that. I know many parents forbid their teenagers from dating until they reach a certain age. And I absolutely understand doing so and even further, I don't even have any kids myself, so I couldn't even understand how difficult it probably is to accept that your kids are doing things that you don't want them to be doing, that they may be, you know, putting themselves at risk by involving themselves in sexual relationships or being in relationships in general. I imagine it's very, very hard, but as we've all heard before, all strict parents do is create sneaky children. 
teens are still going to date whether their parents approve or not. The only difference is that the kid with understanding parents and open parents will go to them if something goes wrong. They will bring the girlfriend or boyfriend home so that the parents have the chance to meet him. Kids with strict parents will not do that. If they are going through something, they won't tell their parents because they're afraid of getting in trouble and they will just try to deal with this stuff themselves. And chances are kids with strict parents don't even understand how they should be treated in relationships because their parents probably never told them because they're not supposed to be dating anyways. If a parent really does not think that their child should be dating, of course they're not gonna have this talk with them. Of course they're just gonna say, you're waiting, you're not dating. There's no way that you're gonna date and if I find out you're dating, you're gonna get in trouble. I think that is the worst thing that you can do for your child who is at this age because again, they're at school for eight hours a day. They might be involved in extracurriculars. They might be going to sports games and things like that. And you will never have 100% control over what your kid is doing at school. You don't get to see what they're doing. You might not get to see who they're even texting. And if you do have parental controls on their phone, they're probably finding another way to contact that person. So the best thing that you can do is to build that trust with your child, which is exactly what Vicky was trying to do. So in terms of being strict parents and being open parents, I do not think that was a factor at all in Jenny's case. I think the biggest factor for Jenny was just that teenagers did not know what a relationship was actually supposed to be like. They didn't know what was normal and what was abuse. It's not that Vicky was someone that Jenny could not talk to. It was maybe that Jenny didn't even know there was a problem at all. So I think there needs to be a good mixing of teaching kids about healthy relationships, but also being an open ear, telling them that these are things that you should not accept. I don't want you to be getting into intimate relationships. I don't want you to date, but if you do, you can tell me. I think that is probably the best way to go about it because again, we need to teach kids and teenagers and everyone how they should be treated. I think what Vicky is doing is so absolutely amazing and has saved so many lives and prevented so many more situations just like this one from happening to another young boy or girl. Thank you guys so much for listening to Jenny's story and for listening to me ramble on about, you know, these types of relationships and the lessons that we can learn. And I'm very grateful that my platform is able to reach women between the ages of my demographics of 18 to 30 so you can hear these messages directly from me from me to you i want to tell you that you deserve to be treated with nothing less than a hundred percent respect you don't deserve a man or a woman that yells at you you don't deserve to be treated like anything less than a human being that you are you deserve to be treated with respect you are beautiful and you are important you are important to so many other people and you you are doing so many great things in your life and you should have a partner that makes you feel that exact same way. I hope that some of you were able to leave this video with some important messages and know how to better protect yourself and your loved ones and how you deserve to be treated and the relationships that you should be in. This does not just apply to teenagers, but everyone in your life. I always say that we need to do a better job of keeping an eye out for one another, speaking up when something seems off, and being someone that others can trust. That is all I ask of you guys is to speak up when you see or hear something off and to be someone that your friends and loved ones can go to because you can be that person that gets someone out of a relationship that they should not be in. You can be the person that saves someone from having the same fate as Jenny Crompton. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. I could talk about this topic for hours because I am so freaking passionate about this topic, but I'm just going to end it there. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Thank you to the girl who sent this case suggestion to me. She also thought that it was so important for me to get this message out. And I'm very thankful that you sent me that request. But either way, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.